Okay, welcome everybody to the second uh, webinar for the from the Exeter Centre for Circular Economy. And um, for those who haven't been with us before, uh, 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 particularly, um, you know, sort of uh, ple pleased to see you on the call today. No doubt you've been attracted by the, the speaker today, Ken Webster. Many of you will know Ken and I'll allow Ken to say a little bit about himself in a minute. Uh, but, but just a, a bit of a, a background, I've worked with Ken for the best part of 10 years and when I first met Ken, he was telling me about this, this idea that he was working on called the circular economy and the, and the role of uh, living systems as, as an underlying metaphor or, or sort of source of inspiration. So it's really interesting to have Ken almost you know, 10 years later uh, Doing as a, giving us an update on, on that topic and uh, thinking about where has the circular economy got to uh, in 2020 uh, and tell us a little bit about his uh, ongoing work in this area. So Ken, can I, can I hand over to you? Yeah, thank you very much, Peter. This is just um, a very quick sound check. It will be slightly echoey because I'm doing this from a, a chapel a room which was a chapel and built in 1819. So it's going to echo around a bit, but if um, you tech people think that's okay, I'll carry on. Yep, no, it's fine. Yeah? yeah, it's all good, yeah. Right, I'm, I'm just dying for one more person to join because I've got 99 participants listed, <laughs> which is, is great fun and thanks everybody for, for coming. Let's hope I can make it worth uh, your attention. Uh, my background really is in uh, education. Oh, I've got a hundred, therefore I'm, I'm great. Uh, background in education, I was a teacher, I was a teacher trainer, worked at Manchester University and uh, spent quite a lot of time working on um, education for sustainable development or education for sustainability. And then because of my economics background, I got rather frustrated with the approaches that you would see in, in schooling typically, but also in, in universities. And um, I began to write more and more about uh, a shift uh, towards an orientation that, that allowed uh, it to be an economic opportunity driven by innovation as Walter Stahl will have it. And in that capacity, I was at the beginning of the Ellen MacArthur Foundation and uh, I'd worked really looking through many of the related schools of thought that we will discuss briefly now. But I worked with the Ellen MacArthur Foundation uh, from 2010 to 2018, late 2018. And um, I've worked since then at the, the business school in Exeter. And that's, that brings us up to date. So this is a bit of a reflection on where we might be. And I'm going to go straight in there. If you really don't know much about the circular economy, you're going to be swimming for your life. Uh, but um, if you do, that's, that's great, of course. And if you are sort of looking for a useful sort of commonality about circular economy, because it's very much an umbrella concept, I think I, I'm going to point you to this paper by Borello, Pascucci, etc. And And I, I think it's lovely because it really, if you like, illuminates the jumping off point for today's uh, exploration. So it's gathering principles from other schools of thought. It's evoking a socio-technical transition uh, through innovative industrial systems. And the one we're most interested in perhaps today is this idea of, they claim, by means of an eco-effectiveness approach to industrial systems. Uh, I'm not so sure they're quite right, but certainly that's the aspirations. That's what you will find in much of the literature. And uh, the power of circular economy, and it was partly framed in this way around the turn of 2010 to 12, it was framed this way, at least in the Ellen MacArthur Foundation, was to appeal to business community and policymaking community. Uh, it was meant to be something that they would uh, find, find useful, attractive, positive, and um, if you like, draw upon living systems. We will get to a little bit more detail uh, in a moment, but it's been so successful that you find uh, it all over the place now in the policy and business areas. Here's just the former EU commissioner, Janusz Potocznik, uh, in a recent presentation for Systemic. 
This is his slide. Uh, this is how he summarizes what it is. And I think that's in essence what a lot of the attraction is for policymakers because it promises at least a, a form of decoupling of economic growth from the resource use and environmental impact. And as part of the package needed to deliver the SDGs, some people see it as a toolbox for change. Other people see it more as a lens on, on how you look at resources. I'm in the latter camp. But whatever you might say, it certainly reached well into the European Union. Here's another slide again from uh, Janusz, which summarizes aspects of the action plan for the, uh, what Europe's calling the European uh, Green Deal. And you'll find what you'd expect in there you probably also notice it's a little bit deficient on the, the bio side of things. But since we're talking about uh, perspectives, let me just go a little bit further into this eco-effectiveness thing by drawing again on Borello and Pascucci. And I've added uh, arrows all over the place. And, and it's not all of the, I'm sure I haven't got every arrow that might be in there. It depends how you'd like to define using insights for living systems. And I realized, I think I have to admit it, that I've never read The Natural Step. So I don't know, that's why there's no arrow there. I'm not, I don't know if it does. Uh, and I think that's a pointer, that, that confession is a pointer to the breadth of influences on what we um, usefully use the term circular economy to cover. So it's certainly woven in there that insights from living systems, these metaphors are important in trying to give a sense of, a picture of, how we might work in circular economy. Uh, and, and the as essence of that, uh, you can pick up from this EPA, and they're, they're a consultancy or a part of Dreesen Somner now, uh, originally Michael Braungart's uh, agency. And they're talking about a nutrient economy, because this is one of the characteristics of living systems, that the waste is food for the system, and of, uh, in a familiar way, you will see from cradle to cradle the biological and technical cycles, which Alan MacArthur Foundation picked up and put in the center of its work. So it's, it's nutrients. They're going a big claim there. They're going for industry 5.0. Uh, and I'm sure there are lots of different claims for that. But it seems to be positioned, at least by them, as you probably expect, to be a, a central way of approaching uh, the, the upcoming industrial changes. Now, from my own perspective, the symmetry of this is really quite nice. On the left, you have your the take, make and dispose and powered by fossil fuels uh, with an element I bring in, but not many people do, that is the money. Element money is debt, which drives it very much, which uh, allows you to get returns from uh, economic growth, because in a way, why would you lend money if there wasn't going to be a return? And the flip cycle on, the, on this side is to move away from fossils towards renewable energy and energy efficiency. It does uh, suggest also that you, you're not just swapping out fossil for, for renewables. There is this idea that you can lower the threshold at which you, you need to supply energy in many contexts through using a circular economy. But there's the two cycles, you know, the, the products of consumption on the left, these are things that always get broken down. And the technical cycle on the right, where only human endeavor can put these things back together. And nobody really knows what money and finance would look like in a restorative circular economy. But uh, I've had a, a, a bit of a go at that and a new book coming out, uh, I hope next year, we'll explore that in more detail. But the two things I have to sort of go back to, well, one of them I've mentioned is money, but the fossil fuel things, so much of what we're trying to cope with in the uh, circular economy is a direct consequence of the, the use of fossil fuels, of course. Okay, so that sounds, that, that looks tidy, this is intuitive. So why do we see a lot of this then? You know, the, the effort gone in, uh, in terms of living systems was to take this notion that there are basically two pretty core cycles to how you deal with materials. But you look through just, you know, Google circular economy images, and most of the time you just see one circle. 
uh, and, and I had a look at this one. This is Richmond in Canada, but I think it's, it's much the same if you dig around into things in Finland and elsewhere. This one seems to be derived from stuff I've seen quite frequently. And my little arrows in this case are sort of saying, well, what are they saying? What's the diagram trying to say? And it very much looks like um, a resource efficiency pitch. And uh, on the left-hand side with innovation, resources as long as possible. Well, actually, Brown, Dark, Madonna and others never said it was as long as possible. You know, they had the notions of a defined use period. Uh, a friend of mine dug out, almost literally, from his attic, among all the junk, a 1997 Macintosh computer. And with a bit of effort and a new PRAM battery, he got it working, software and all. And then, then we had to say, well, <laughs> you know, very good, but what, what the heck use is it? What can you actually do on it these days? So the aim isn't to have things last as long as possible. It's to define the use period which is appropriate. Otherwise, you get really pretty strange thinking. But that is part of that, I would argue, that resource efficiency thing is you just got to hang on to it. Uh, and um, if you like, minimize the harm. It's do less harm. In other words, the economy is sort of all right, but it's a bit messy. We can just tidy it up. And by the way, you always have to stick in the corner. Uh, it feels like an add-on in this picture. It feels like we've, we've added on the, the community thing. See if I can move my floating palette there. Okay, so there may be a different perspective here, this difference between efficiency and effectiveness. We'll come into this a bit more. Because Brown, Gart, and Madonna always argued that if you shift towards clean energy, renewables principally, if you treat waste as food and you celebrate diversity, uh, often that goes by the by. You know, when, when cradle to cradle says, and celebrate diversity, people go, well, yeah, I, I think, think that's being more inclusive, isn't it? Well, yes, but there's also something more to it about the structure of systems in living systems. Diversity is a source of resilience and creativity. You know, it's not just, uh, you know, some people treat it as a sort of socially inclusive uh, notion, strangely. But anyway, get back to the mainstream. Here's Accenture having a good day. Uh, and um, you can see in this one that, that their sense of, they, they see five dominant ways to deal with this uh, circular economy question in terms of business models. And it's driven by digital, which is something that's, that's widely accepted. And it's around extending product life. Uh, it's around shifting from products to services, of course, and sharing platforms as a version of that. There's relatively little around um, resource recovery, or, or, or rather there's a lot going on, but it isn't really necessarily a, a core business opportunity, or it's, a, it's a, the cycle of last resort, perhaps. You have to do it, but where's, where's the benefit? So why is that sort of matter, this difference between being more efficient and then being more effective? Well, the problem with efficiency is it's still really relying on scale and sale, as I put it that way. And this, this diagram is fairly intuitive as well. If you go for large scale, you've got high fixed costs, you get low variable costs uh, as a consequence of going to the scale. You, you try and dump labor your lower costs of production, but you're left with, uh, as some people call it, overproduction. Very easily you can get overproduction. In other words, you've got so much stuff coming through so efficiently that you've got to find a home for it. So of course that means your marketing, you get consumer credit on the roll. Built-in obsolescence is no real worry for you. In fact, it's a great idea to make sure that customers come back. You don't want the responsibility for the stuff. You never want to see it again. You just want to be compliant. There's going to be an environmental impact, but that's dealt with by the customer and the public sector. You want stable conditions over 20 years so that your investment pays back. And as I've mentioned, you're very keen probably to cut labor because it's one of your highest costs. And so what's the flip on this? Well, more and more people are imagining this sort of general notion of access over ownership because it, as a systems approach, it does internalize a lot of the problems and makes them uh, advantages. So you might go for smaller scale, so you've got higher variable costs, 
But because you're selling access again and again, you're maintaining capital, you're going to get lots of the benefits on the left-hand side. And that's quite a, a major shift, as we know, if we've been looking into circular economy or doing it. It's a very big, it's a very big shift. Anybody who's tried it knows that it isn't at all easy. But oddly, you see, this might well fit with the era we're in. Imagine an era of low growth. Well, hmm, maybe now. Uh, changing demographics. Yeah, societies are getting older in, in most of the OECD. Climate change, whoops, yes, the big one. We've got new technologies. Where will the profit come from? Because if you can't sell more and more, and anyway, it's really cheap and easy to produce stuff, what's the point of <laughs> selling a bucket for 90 pence when it's, it's perfectly large number of people who are selling it at 91? You know, it's just a mad market to be in if it's for, for everyday sort of stuff. So what do you want to do? Well, maybe you want to create scarcity. Well, why scarcity? Well, scarcity is where you get price from. If everything is really, really abundant, you don't need to charge very much. Hmm, that's interesting. Let's get back to that in a moment. Now, this is uh, Walter Stachel's stuff. Uh, and obviously, it was used in a slide set that was shall we say, uh, not necessarily in Europe. So he's always talking about the near of R, uh, you know, to reuse, repair, and all of that sort of thing, which is the extended product life, shift to uh, products to services. And the era of D talks about a lot now, which is getting pure molecules back. So maybe we're talking about a total product liability. That's the phrase he uses. In other words, the source of the uh, questions around the products uh, mostly lie with the, the manufacturer. But if we can create new asset classes, this isn't Walter speaking, it's me laying it on top. If we can control this cycle more and more, there should be, if we're creating in a way a sense of scarcity, because we're not selling the assets, we're just selling access to them. This is in the business, it's called economic rent seeking opportunities. Now it's Perhaps no coincidence that there's a lot of interest in economic rents since uh, it dominates the economy at the moment. Um, if you like, in response to the different crises we've had in 2008 and 2020, the immediate money, the big money, went straight into making sure asset prices were maintained. So it's an asset-focused economy. Uh, there's you know, mountains of evidence for that. But... Um, Looking at this idea of the material cycle, um, there was a recent, only yesterday actually, Paul Eakins was talking about uh, from extended producer responsibility to producer ownership. And I know, okay, there's quite a bit of text there, but it's worth you reading it as I, as I talk. He claims that you're not going to sort this problem out with materials and waste if you don't have a sense that the person who produced it is responsible, acts as the owner or is the owner of these products. Uh, because you're not going to in encourage innovative solutions without this responsibility, if you like. Uh, let's go a little bit further with that. Oh, I had added another uh, slide from Paul Eakins there, but it's not, uh, must have been in this set. He says that a lot of the work done with circular economy won't get very far uh, because the incentives are essentially not in the right direction. There's a systems element to this, which of course he's uh, perfectly right to say that. So how would you do it? Well, their big idea, not theirs alone, of course, is to make sure that producer ownership is, is, is looked at as a, a, a new way forward. Finland or Citra is very keen on, on exploring this and has done some work on it. So, okay, you've got this idea that maybe actually we can uh, focus on assets, making them available, and maybe we can control the flow of these things so that we can get profits out of selling less because we're selling access to it. Now, it's no surprise that the digital world reinforces this. Um, and so you're headed for a degree of... Uh, efficiency, shall we say, and by using Metcalfe's law of networks, which means that the number of connections is the square of the number of nodes, we've realized how much uh, very large scale operations can 
leverage the benefits of their networks to aggregate control of particular sectors. So you have on the one hand, a notion that we can use products, components, materials as assets. And on the other hand, there's a way of making sure that these, um, this, this information that you need to do all these things and the connections you will need to make in the whole system get easier and easier and become more and more concentrated. Now, how mad it can be is um, looking at things like Uber. Lots of these very large sharing economy businesses that have come along, they don't even make money. And the reason they don't make money partly is they're going through predatory pricing approaches to dominate the market. Is Uber going to be in just ride hailing or is it into logistics generally? They're all after that effect uh, of being the dominant player there. Uh, so quick to spend money that I think uh, Uber and Lyft uh, managed to get uh, changes to the law, which would have said that they're, uh, the people they employ or use as contractors are not employees. That was in California recently. Uh, and as far as resources go, this effort to be dominating a market, of course, has been a disaster for resources. Um, we've all seen pictures of these in these dockless schemes, and they're, 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 you know, they're thinning out now, the dockless schemes, as again, it's a really big fight for who controls uh, the market and particularly the data. So at the moment, they make no sense whatsoever uh, in resource terms, but painting this overall picture of innovation and change and what it appears to be throwing up, we could perhaps just switch slightly into the bio cycle here because uh, efforts here to create a different approach to producing food proteins. Uh, and this one is sort of using bacteria that use hydrogen as a, a food, uh, food source. Uh, on my last slide, I've got the proper term for these bacteria because I keep forgetting it. But this is like um, protein from air, if you like. It's uh, using CO2 and hydrogen and water. So this is, uh, if you like, a concentration of, a potentially concentration of control of some of the food production areas in the fast growing area of synthetic biology, cell lab meat, which is now, you can, you can enjoy that in Singapore. It's available in one restaurant, it's been approved. Uh, you've got plant-based burgers and so on, which is very much a sort of IP and uh, um, if you like, another form of uh, protecting assets. So we seem to have lots of opportunities for more efficiency, but it seems to point towards a concentration of business ownership. Um, but what about this technology is supposed to be giving us a more distributed or peer-to-peer uh, -peer sort of relationships? And why not have decentralized and disintermediated connections because it's all so much possible. And particularly say with biomaterials, we don't have to be thinking about bioreactors and uh, new forms of developing proteins for aquaculture, do we? Uh, a great deal of effort in harnessing what's available uh, locally or what we already have. Uh, I put an example of Biome, a, a company in uh, well, I think they just moved to London, but they were in Somerset. It's an example of, let's see what we can take from the bio side, which is locally available. Materium is another good um, a company in that area. And there is this tension, it seems. Now, how does that relate back to our questions around eco-efficient? Well, I will just throw this little thing in here. And it's from Paul Mason. It's something I used a few years ago, but I thought it deserved a new airing. And I think he's essentially right. Uh, everything is pervaded by a fight between network and hierarchy. Uh, hierarchy re relates well to efficiency, to a limited control of uh, networks, platforms, IP, assets. And there is at the same time, because of uh, the developments of digital technology and the rest of it, a perfectly good way of producing things, many things, a much uh, smaller scale at relatively low cost and engaging people in a more peer-to-peer -peer sense. So these, this needs to be a tension in understanding the systems. 
And as we move back towards looking at eco-effectiveness, here's Gunter Pauli, always a sharp-dressed man. Uh, he says that actually there's something more important going on here than just perhaps the more visible politics. He says, if we get back to this um, living systems insight, this is how nature works. It goes from sufficiency to abundance. And of course, the economic system, as I've been trying to relate, uses scarcity as a basis for production and consumption. These are really very different approaches. Okay, now the circular economy, if it picks up on eco-effective notions, it's trying to take insights from living systems. But most workers in the circular economy area don't bother thinking, uh, I would probably exclude people doing uh, biomimicry, they don't really try and explore other aspects of what it means to take a living systems perspective. And the very notion of effective systems is, it, it is a dynamic between efficiency and resilience. In real life ecosystems, the interplay between these two tendencies, if you like, uh, gives you an effective system. And let me try and expand on that. Authors claim this sort of structure and it's handed, if you like, it's moved slightly towards the, the resilience end as the more important, it's not perfectly balanced. Um, this means that this applies to almost all of these flow networks, anywhere where you've got energy flowing through data, the original thing was done on banking, molecules, flows, ecosystems, and what have you. So if you want to have an effective system, you have to interplay efficiency with something else, which is resilience. Let's try and look at this in using, again, an, an insights from living systems. Nick Salangaros is a sort of, I would call him a polymath. And um, he points out something that was been known for decades, that uh, living cities have intrinsically fractal properties. In other words, they're self-similar at different scale in common with all living systems. This is a diagram for Christopher Alexander. You've got your big channels, the big flow ones, but you've also got an exchange function down at the, the very small level. And out of the interplay between the two, you get an effective system. Why is resilience there in the, in the smaller things? It can take damage. It can take damage and self-repair. It's always changing, but if you take damage in the big flow elements, like the banking crashing of 2008, the whole thing falls over. Just as a teaser, here's a, a diagram, of an image from a latest article I did in Future Arc magazine, where they juxtaposed my cellular networks with the city ones. And I think that's, that's quite fun. It's not saying it works exactly like that, but there are elements of the way a city works, which does mimic uh, living systems. Now, trying to make this a little bit more specific, let's take this idea of resilience and efficiency and apply it to a tree. This is a tree with a, approximately the right scale in terms of uh, root networks and, and uh, leaf, leaf systems. The attention we usually put in the economy and in most circular economy is about the flow and the structure, the big channels. Whereas most of the action, as everybody will realize with a moment's reflection, most of the action happens at the so-called periphery. In fact, you might flip it around and say the solid flow structures are a way of the periphery being supported, not the other way around. Here, we sort of assume that if you get a bigger and bigger trunk and stronger and stronger main root networks, you get a better tree. Uh, you don't. You get a tree which is more vulnerable, actually. It's not so able to survive. So the exchange function, as I call it, or other people do, is just as important in the circular economy if we're taking insights from living systems as the main attempts at looking at efficiency. Uh, and, it, and one of the big elements of that is, well, asking how does this happen? Well, almost all of the businesses, if you switch to a business element, at the periphery, so-called, are small businesses. They don't have a lot of capital. So if they're to be enabled to exchange more, it means they have to have infrastructure, uh, not provided to them out of some sort of, oh, well, they can have a new village hall, sort of, oh, isn't it nice? As, but as an essential part of uh, creating a, a truly eco-effective economy. 
They want to be able to add value with what they already have through circulating income and cash and expenditure locally and building from sufficiency through to abundance. Uh, that's at the, the minor level, but of course, these are system we're talking about. And um, okay, there's a disreputable group of people in the background. Perhaps we might see them that way, but there is an element here that you've got to have systems which uh, allow, encourage, enable a, a, a flow which imitates living systems. Because one of the things we say about um, human bodies is you've got to have the blood. The blood has to reach the toes as well as the uh, go down the arteries. Because if you ignore the, the toe with no blood, you're going to end up uh, potentially uh, killing off the overall organism. So in a insights from living systems sort of circular economy, you've got to think as much about, if you like, the return flow to the periphery, as well as how well the, the efficiency elements of structure is running. So just finishing off now, this was taken from something Kate Rayworth did uh, some years ago uh, at Exeter on the inaugural lecture. But there was a question of what circular economy is merging, she was asking. Is it centralized, as I've been discussing in around the efficiency element, uh, top down? Very few firms will dominate that. It's all about IP. Or is it going to be this distributive circularity, open standards and whatever? Well, in a way, I think if you're looking at living systems, the knockout punch in a way is this. Effective rather than efficient answers both. You have to have both. Now, that's not exactly rocket science, but it is important because the question is, how far should we continue with this emphasis on efficiency, supply side and efficiency, when we know from taking insights from living systems, we have to pay attention to the, uh, the network, the distributive elements. And, and actually, you know, the old phrase, you have to feed the forest to feed the trees is very apt here. You have to have both. So the question is, how do we uh, get both uh, when the, the dominant ideology seems to be around efficiency and lowering the cost of ownership and access uh, as though it was almost limitless, the ability for consumer surplus to be used that way. So that, that's me, that's me done. And there's a reminder of what I should have remembered that these are the organisms that are able to metabolize molecular hydrogen as a source of energy. So I'm going to stop sh screen sharing and uh, let's get into some, and uh, if you don't mind, I'll pin my Thanks, video. Ken. Thanks, okay, so that's brilliant. Thank you, Ken, very clear as always and um, uh, very stimulating set of ideas and challenges. Um, I've got a couple of questions in the chat box. I don't know if Alex is there and then um, Costa, whether they want to come and ask their questions directly. Alex, are you there? Yeah, hello. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. Go on. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, this is uh, this is Alex from uh, from Unilever. I'm uh, I'm looking at the sustainability agenda for the workplace, business, travel, and fleet uh, globally. And uh, my my question was was more towards how how do you see the current or or traditional capitalism that that kind of governs everything switching over to a green one with with circular economy as the DNA and the foundation of, of, of the thinking there? Um, that's, a, that's a big question, isn't it? I, I usually try and avoid using the word capitalism at all in, in any replies because it seems to such a, a polarizing word. But if I say, how would the current uh, economic system uh, be reimagined? Well, at the heart of where we are at the moment seems to be still this machine idea, this idea of throughput and converting uh, national and social capital into financial capital. And as um, uh, one writer, George Cooper, I think, said that um, capitalism, to pick up the word I didn't want to play with because I'm doing a quote, capitalism concentrates, democracy distributes. And in a way, that's just that simple notion that you can't keep extracting from a system, you can't keep taking economic rents because you end up with something called debt deflation, uh, which is that the, the financial sector is so dominant that there's a real paucity of spending in the economy, which then prevents 
uh, if you like, development of a thriving economy. So we're on the, pretty on the edge of debt deflation anyway. And so part of what this discussion about eco-effective systems seems to say is, we need to be able to feed the base with income, with tools, with opportunities to use the materials which can cascade uh, at local and regional level to provide a suitable base for growing up from the base while at the same time accepting that very large firms will probably dominate in many of the, the larger scale durables. It's hard to know how you would stop that happening. Uh, and then the question is more uh, than politically about how do we adjust the rules of the game or the furniture in the room to enable that to happen. Now, I won't venture on what should happen. I'm just painting the picture of it has to be distributive to the base in some way. People like Mark Blythe talk about, uh, you should read his book, Angrynomics, if you haven't looked at it already. He's talking about a, a, a digital dividend. He's talking about a citizen's wealth fund and, and other ideas by, like that. But I won't get into that. But what I'm saying to start with is we take a living systems perspective. The idea of going from extractive to circulatory is sort of, you know, that's not rocket science. Uh, it, how you do it is a, is a big political uh, game, but um, that's, that's the principles. That's what it would tell you. We've got to go circulatory uh, in the money cycle as well as the physical cycle. Thanks for the question. It's excellent. Yeah, thank, thanks, Alex. So questions beginning to, to come in. So I'm conscious of time. We've got about 17 minutes. I'm going to ask Costa next, and then I've asked Manuel whether he'd like to ask his question after that, and then uh, Stefano after that, if they're all... Yeah, I'll try and keep it brief, the answers. Yeah, no problem, Ken. It's uh, always interesting to hear uh, the, the response. Okay. Thank Costa? you, Peter. Thank you so much, Peter. Thank you for the opportunity, Ken. Thank you so much for the, as always, engaging presentation. Um, no introductions. I'll go straight into the, the question, if possible. Um, Ken, in the earlier response, you talked about democracies being distributive. Um, you just finished the previous answer by saying that we need to go circulatory. And I just want to just remind me of that quote by Paul Mason that you that you showed that there's this, this kind of almost kind of antagonism between circulation flows and the fixed hierarchy of structures. Now, without going into capitalism, because you said, you know, it's a divisive term, but it, it assumes some kind of an antagonistic pull between flows and structures between movement and fixed states. Yeah. So are networks a way of mediating between the two, is, uh, of organizing without a revolution? And if so, um, what kind of a network? Or is there a, a hierarchy of networks? Are there certain network, networks that are better uh, for doing this? That's a very difficult question, as you will know. Uh, but it, just a comment or two on it, really. Uh, one of the big worries is that the networks also become part of the hierarchy. In other words, there is a, there's a lot of enthusiasm when the digital age started for enabling peer-to-peer -peer networks to build up. But we ended up with Facebook and Instagram and, and TikTok uh, very often, which act as echo chambers for all sorts of uh, ideas. And so, yes, theoretically, if people have the tools and it's easy to make things, you know, social production is much more possible. That's a great start, but they have to be enabled by the right sort of incentive systems, uh, you see. So there's a bit of a chicken and egg here. If you've got an extractive economy at the moment, to go to a network and circulatory economy with under the same basic rules, it's not going to happen. We know that from systems theory anyway, you know. And what makes, uh, yeah. I'll sort of stop there. It's got potential, but it's it's looking a little bit worrying at the moment, that because there isn't this this feed into the base, this enabling to allow a participatory economy in the way that you might uh, have hoped. Okay, I think I think Manuel's going to follow up uh, on that point, uh, Ken, if he's there, Manuel. Hello, Ken. Hello, Peter. Thank you. So my my question goes regarding permeability. So and when I say permeability is uh, the relation between flows and structures in natural systems, and how would this be could be enabled, or how, what's your vision on this in a human society? Um, I don't know. Thinking that maybe there is a lack of goals in natural system. There is one same goal for all the natural system, which is the, the dynamic equilibrium. 
I believe, uh, how in human societies and organizations and different types of organizations would you see this, this exchange between flows and structures and powers? Well, I didn't quite hear everything because I think you, you, you were quite quiet and I didn't, wasn't able to amplify it enough. Um, but what I just want to, I just want to put this thought in, in our minds. All of the economists, the classical economists from Adam Smith onwards until the end of the 19th century, you know what their main concern was? Trying to get rid of the rentier, in, the, in other words, the landowner, because it was inefficient, because that was extractive of economic rent. It was income that wasn't earned, you know, so had no place really in a in an enterprise society. All of the economists for that period of time were asking the question, how do we get the balance right between extractive and circulatory? In fact, Adam Smith used the term the great circulation. Yeah. And uh, it's interesting that these, these questions keep coming back. We haven't solved that. We're into another situation, which is post the labor versus capital thing, it seems to be, and, and might be orientated around the salariat, you know, the salaried folks and the gig workers and the precariat as standing calls them. So we're into a continued uh, discussion about that, but we know that if we have a, a too efficient society, it's very brittle and falls over. If we have a too uh, networked or a too, um, uh, if you like, resilient society, nothing really changes at any touch speed at all. I'll leave it that. I don't think I was able to answer your question because I didn't pick it all up, but we don't. No, no I, 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 drop me a line, yeah? Yep, yeah, we can copy these uh, out, Ken, and uh, I'll do a little write-up of, of this afterwards as well. I think you've, you've, you're looking at the questions that are coming in afterwards, aren't you? Because you've just teed up yeah. the next question from Stefano perfectly right. well. So, Stefano. Yeah, that's that's funny. Indeed, I was, um, I'm trying to figure out, you know, why economists are not bothered. So this is an economy without economists, which perhaps is, is the best good news that we could think of you know um sorry just a, just a joke um yeah what, what's your take on this because what you're discussing you know um has been at the heart of heart of of economics as a discipline i'm talking about really the discipline uh for 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 since ever yeah uh, but they don't bother why why, why is that well uh, you'd have to ask them but in a way this is almost like um there are a number of people who are interested in complexity economics, as you know, uh, people like Eric Beinhocker, and he's, uh, he's doing a book with Nick Hanauer, the industrialists, which very much has different perspectives at the background to it. He's, he's a very much a systems guy. He talks about gardens rather than machines when we're talking about markets. It, it is a different lens, but I would probably say that um, Things only change when there's a crisis. This is sort of slightly derived from Milton Friedman, of course. Things change when there is a crisis. At the moment, we have an economy which seems to be reluctant to change its basic orientation. And I don't know where the, the, the turning point will be in this, but I think there will there'll have to be uh, this, this evolution of economics towards one which, if you like, takes a complex systems perspective rather than tries to fit it to a a really quite strange notion that in the future we're all in long-term equilibrium and X marks the spot and it's sort of deterministic. It just looks out of place at the moment. Of course, the reason that people stick with it is that um, it's good for their career, I imagine. Uh, but um, you'd have to ask them really. They, they're very sophisticated with their modeling, but the assumptions that's based upon seem to be rather um, in inconsistent, shall we say, given the, the state of the modern world. I mean, could I just jump in with just a, a, a little follow on question there, because mm -hmm. at the outset, you said, you know, you'd spent your life in education. Mm -hmm. um, and could, could you just give us a bit of your thoughts? You've been in the university a couple of years about mm -hmm. where does circular economy fit in the uh, in, 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 in education, do you think? What, what, what would you like to see happen, whether it's in a business school or, or in any any educational context well in in a couple of lines one it, it works very well in business school because if the dominant activity is generating economic rents uh, circular economy can fit in that very well indeed 
you know, so there'll be no, there's no downside to that within a traditional uh, business school output, if you like. There's, there's money to be made in it. Uh, but in a more general sense, because it at the moment lacks a theory or a way of fitting in with an approach to how we might uh, look at production, consumption and exchange overall, including the money cycle, it's, it's, a, it's a, a subject or a, not a discipline, but it's a, a, an area of thought which has yet to become more coherent enough uh, to, to offer what some people would want. Um, I was always struck by the way that um, consultancies never look, like to look at what Gunter Powell is doing because they say, oh, well, you know, that's, that's, um, that doesn't really go to scale or it's too much X, Y, or, he's, he, or he often fails as an, an entrepreneur. And I thought, this is telling me more about what they think economics and business is around rather than what uh, he is actually involved in and able to be stimulating. So I'd say it's very comfortable at the moment but there's a lack of a coherent view around how it, circular economy might fit with a more. That's why I'm trying to tease it out a little bit to get yeah, today. Yeah, no, that's great. Okay. Mm -hmm. Great. I've got another couple of questions lined. I've got Victor, and then I've got a question from David, who, which sort of picks up, I think, a little bit on, on um, you know, what, what happens inside organisations. And there's a question from Francisco, for, Francisco from. Uh, Brazil, but but his, uh, his uh, internet is unstable, so he wants me to ask his question for him. So Victor and then David, uh, we've got about eight, seven or eight minutes left, so let, let's rattle through them. Victor, okay. perfect. Can can you guys hear me? Yeah. First of all, thanks a lot for the insightful presentation. But my my question is really uh, broad. But uh, I'd like for you if you could enlighten us on how your work uh, towards this circulatory change or systemic uh, change, how, how you, you have been working these years or, or what direction, what you've been doing lately, and if you have any uh, tips or sources that we could look into to, let's say, deepen this uh, knowledge or try to work toward, towards that direction. Um, much of my time when I've not been teaching uh, modules and interesting things with students and, and, their, and stuff like that, has been around at looking at the relationship between monetary cycles and uh, product component material cycles. There is a relationship. If you accept that money is active in the system, traditional economists say it's not, it's neutral. Um, the second thing is, there's a question of applying systems to the to the whole question you know can we apply systems thinking not just in theory but well yeah can we develop the theory but also what would it spin off in practice uh, and thirdly there's a big underestimated underestimation in my view of the bio cycle it's not dealt with properly at all in fact most of the flows if you look at the butterfly diagram it should be the bio cycle should be huge the actual num amount of flows going on in there is far in excess of anything in the technical cycle so any tips on this? No, I, no. Uh, it draws, the, all of this sort of work draws from so many sources that I, I think I'd be in, uh, in trouble with myself for just picking on one or two. But it's essentially understanding systems uh, and insights from living systems. Anything to do with that is usually good. W. Brian Arthur is excellent. And also uh, Eric Beinhocker is a bit of a hero of mine on that. Uh, so I'll probably leave it at that next. Question, please. There's also Ken, isn't there a wealth of flows by Ken Webster? Yeah, I did that, but um, I come from an age where you never recommend your own stuff. Well, okay, I've just recommended it on your behalf. David. Very quickly, okay. Thank you, thank you, Ken, for your uh, uh, for your lectures. So just uh, uh, on democracy, I, I wanted to know. You know, I, I read recently this book that I put in in the chat, uh, talking about the democracy failed. It's failing because it stopped uh, outside the wall of the corporation and uh, it's not coming inside the corporation and and restructuring the way that the corporation works. <laughs> And I wonder if, you know, when you talk about democracy, are you talking about new forms of democracy, including uh, <clears throat> in the workplace? Yeah, Marjorie Kelly is very good on that. She says that uh, discussions around ownership are, are pivotal, pivotal for how we discuss the economy. As Marjorie Kelly, she does a lot on ownership. Uh, and, uh, but I'm talking more in a way about if the resilient end of the systems discussion 
is enabled, it becomes a form of participatory democracy in the sense that more people are involved with their own economic activity or small scale or related things. And they, they practice, if you like, decision making around what matters to their lives uh, because that, that is a way that we can grow their schools for democracy, if you like, businesses at that end of the system, if they, if they can become more widespread. They become schools for democracy and, uh, and people need to be able to know what to demand of their politicians. And one of the best ways to do that is to be more involved in a practical way, not just showing up on the streets or at the, the, the box, the voting booth. I have to stop there with that one. Right. But, okay. I'm going to I'm going to ask a question for Francisco Sabadini, he's professor at Rio de Janeiro State University, and he thanks you for the presentation, Ken. And it's a question on the role and challenges for emerging economies like Brazil, India, Russia, mm -hmm. in the transition to a circular economy. So what? what well, there's two things to say on that. Walter Stahl always says that they'll they it needs a sophisticated in, sophisticated infrastructure to do some of these things. Uh, I would also, uh, I would say rather, it, it really needs um, to take more of the insights from folks like Gunter Pauli and others who are really talking about adding value with what we have and circulating income expenditure more locally. In other words, providing the infrastructure and the incentives to, to build an economy which allows cascading of materials and products. Um, you know, a lot of the countries uh, in Latin America are big exporters of uh, raw materials. And that's not that, that sort of dependence, whether it's coffee or whether it's iron ore, is, is really, really a difficult situation to be in because it's not going to last. OK, I'll have to stop on that one, okay. but uh, add value with what you've got, policies. Great. And um, James, if you're there, James Foss. Hi. Um, great uh, talk. I really enjoyed it. Um, I have a question about um, how can circularity address existing monopolies? I'm thinking um, about the coffee industry um, is controlled by the commodity flow is concentrated in some companies. Um, they trade the waste from the coffee is being controlled by waste management companies. And if they have a sustainable solution for it. Yeah, well, circular economy can give you a picture of how the system ought to be structured. In other words, more circulatory rather than extractive. Now, the, the classical way that, that all these other economists I was mentioning dealt with economic rent, so you know, earning surplus, uh, was that the unearned income should be taxed uh, in, in some way. And that, but that takes a political will to do that. You probably won't be able to stop them having a concentrated uh, control, but the benefits of what they do ought to be, uh, if you like, should we say dampened down a little uh, or a lot. Um, it's a big political question. All that the circular economy do is pick up on systems theory and say it ought to be an effective system, not just an efficient one, uh, and uh, work from there. At least you have a, a ground to work on. Look, you know, it's not an option. This is how real world systems work. What are you talking about? You know? Right. It's just turned two o'clock, Ken. Uh, mm. I can see one or two people dropping out. We peaked at 124. So well done. Uh, great turnout. Thanks everyone, because I know people have got a lot of people have got to go on to other things. It's a shame because we would have really um, liked to have continued uh, the discussion if, if possible. But let's hold hold it there, and thank Ken uh, with either a digital round of applause or a, um, a real round of applause. I think the comments in the chat box indicate that people really enjoyed it, um, not only in terms of the quality, but also in terms of the insight and the clear sort of dedication Ken that you've given to this topic. Uh, Thank you very much. Don't forget my links are there if, and if you would send me some of the questions yep. from the chat. I'll yep. see what, what can be okay done. so thanks everyone for okay. um, turning up and uh, spending an enjoyable hour with with Ken and we'll uh, we'll follow up we'll put the uh, slides up with Ken's approval and uh, recording of the presentation and a little summary of, of the of the talk so that's great so thanks everyone and uh, enjoy the rest of the day ken go and have a cup of tea yeah. uh, everyone else uh, safe uh, end to the day and the week and have a great weekend and uh, holiday period when you have whenever you get to it okay so cheerio thank you peter very much